This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. And therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do until we talk through things. I go to therapy regularly, once, sometimes twice a week, <laughs> and it was BetterHelp that helped me get back into it right on. pretty seamlessly, actually, and I'm so happy that I did. Look at me in therapy, <laughs> talking out is great. <laughs> for me stuck in my head and full of dread not me i'm in therapy you can stop me anytime i just <laughs> better help connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are it's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries it empowers you to be the best version of yourself it isn't just for those of us who've experienced major trauma right and if you're thinking of trying therapy therapy. <laughs> give, give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online. See all this laughter? Wouldn't happen without therapy. Anyway, it's designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. And all you gotta do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash free today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash fruit. Get ready. Undercover Underage is back. Our goal is the prevention and intervention of the sex abuse of children. We put decoys online working with the sheriff's office. He's a the true predator. There's no telling how many victims are out there. He's driving. Tell him he's driving. Take him down now. That's him. It's dangerous in the dark, but come hell or high water, we have to get him. Show me your hands, you now! Undercover Underage. All new Mondays at 9 on ID. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. Bienvenidos, bitches. Pretty be nuffy, and thank you for listening. Yeah. Now, Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered, as well as the victims, because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgendered, able bodied white dudes. What? No, I'm telling you. And these crimes rarely get any public attention because why? Because the news is r -r 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 racist, <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> And we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. That's right. She's one of the good ones. She does the work, and she <laughs> is a co-conspirator. We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Mm -hmm. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. So, who are we talking about today, Beth? Well, today we're talking about Billy Kip Courier. Shamir Mir, mm -hmm. a Kenyan immigrant to the United States and serial killer. He's been tied to the murders of at least 22 older adults, most of them senior living residents and two attempted murders. Okay. We don't hear about Kenya often. No. Over here in the States. No. Unless it's like some something marathon. Really bad. A mar <laughs> no, 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 a marathon. I was going to say, I heard there's something in the news about a cult where people are starving to death on purpose. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to bring that to the to the Patreon Wait a minute. Episode. That's one of my stories. Yeah. Exactly. Wait a minute. There you go. Hang on a diddly doggone minute. Yeah. 
39 bodies found so far. Okay, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll get into it tomorrow. In our Patreon episode, everybody. That's right. Yeah. Okay, well, before we get into it, how you doing? I'm doing good. Like, everything's kind of busy. I'm a little stressed, yeah. but yeah. excited for some new opportunities we have coming. And uh, Yes, all yeah. those things. Very excited. Speaking of good things, I just got back from the Black Effect Podcast Festival in yeah. Atlanta. Hosted by Charlemagne the God, the Black Effect Podcast Network, and iHeartRadio. There were some big podcasters there. Teslin Figueroa, the Hood Whisperer, they call her. Giselle and Robin from the Real Housewives of Potomac. Hmm. Their podcast is reasonably shady. (laughs) The 85 South is a big podcast for the culture. They were there. The Ladies from Horrible Decisions. It's like an X-rated podcast about sex positivity and Black women. Hmm. And DJ Louis V was the DJ and then Atlanta's own DJ Scream was there. It was it was really, really cool. There was food and drinks and people and like the DJ would play music and like there was dancing and it was it was just really cool. And there was some really good sessions about like podcasting and stuff. Awesome. I made sure I took some notes for. So it was exciting to be there and to all the new people, new listeners that we or I met while I was there. Hello, everybody. It was good to meet you. <laughs> so out of curiosity, were there very many white people there? There were some. And I was curious what they were doing there. Yeah. But it looked like they were either industry people or journalists or their friends brought them. Okay, cool. Yeah, because I was thinking, you know, that you live in Atlanta now and I live in yeah. Phoenix. So there wasn't a way for me to go, you know. Right. It just yeah. wasn't possible. But right. if I had gone, I was wondering if there were any other white people there. Yeah, no, it was really a celebration of blackness in the podcasting space. Right. Yeah. And that's why I would feel not I would feel uncomfortable just because I'm invading the space. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I totally get that because black people would say there are some spaces that are just not for you, my friend. Exactly. Beth. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah. I think that. I do think that Fruit Loops is special and unique in that we get a multi-racial, multi-ethnic voice. That's true. Yeah. To talk about things. And I think that's really powerful, right? Yeah. So generally, well, in my experience, Black people and Black things are not exclus- exclusive. Don't exclude. Right. Generally, it's a more welcoming space more welcoming than it is on the white side where right. was, uh, yeah yeah <laughs> you know what i mean so, <laughs> I do. yeah at least that's been my life experience yeah. yeah but everybody there was having a good time that is awesome for sure. that awesome. is for sure they had a pound cake they were selling watermelon wow. i was like whoa this is good <laughs> <laughs> um so now let's get into some listener letters okay well hello angels thank you <gasps> What's in that bag, Beth? So I wanted to thank Jesse Paul on YouTube for commenting <gasps> on our Grim Sleeper episode. Whoa, we got a YouTube comment? We, They're usually well, not YouTube very comment. nice on YouTube. Yeah, and they, this one wow. was nice. Thanks for not hurting our feelings, <laughs> Jesse Paul. Yeah. And they said, interesting. Oh, this was on the Grim Sleeper episode. Okay. And they said, interesting note. The word, is it fresa? Fresa. Mm-hmm. Fresa mm-hmm. or strawberry in Mexican Spanish is used as slang to call somebody picky. <laughs> That's interesting because yeah. you have to pick strawberries and get on your hands oh, and knees to I do it because they don't grow very high. Yeah, right. so that makes I was a wondering lot why that was. Yeah, yeah. So just to add on to the use of strawberry, look at us learning yeah. stuff. Look at yeah. thanks, fruities. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. And please send any questions or comments to Fruit Loops Pod at gmail dot com. Or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. Also, join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content. And we have a video club for 12 plus patrons where you can interact with us in person. Whoa, 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 whoa. Now we're going to take a quick break and get into the story when we come back. Way back. <laughs> uh, remind us, Beth, who are 
we talking about today? Who's our subject? Our subject today is Billy Kipkorir Shamir Mir, mm-hmm. who has been convicted of the murders of two elderly women in the Dallas area, but is suspected of at least 22 murders and two attempted murders, which were committed between 2016 and 2018. The majority of the crimes occurred in four senior independent living facilities in Dallas, Plano, and Frisco, Texas. All right, now let's get into some stats. <laughs> so all of Tremere Mir's victims were elderly people living in apartments at independent living communities for older people or in private homes. And Shamir Mir would pose as a maintenance worker to gain access to the residents' living quarters and then suffocated them and stole jewelry and other items. And it was, at first, people were like, they were old. They must have died naturally. But the families reported something different, saying that the circumstances were odd and the jewelry was stolen. Yeah. Rest in power to all of the victims. We may not get all their names well, maybe we do. In I this, think we in we covered as many as we could find the mm-hmm. names. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't cover all of their stories because there was so many of them. Yes, but I just wanted to say rest in power to all of the victims. So now let's get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, Billy Shamir Mir was born and grew up in Kenya, which is located in East Africa. Its terrain rises from a low coastal plain on the Indian Ocean to mountains and plateaus at its center. It's famous for its scenic landscapes and vast wildlife preserves. Anytime you use cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, with my eyeballs, I'm going, looking up, never (laughs) eat sucky waffles. And I'm like, oh, east, got it. Okay, so human history in Kenya (laughs) Dates back millions of years and trading relations existed for centuries between southern Arabia and the coastline of what is now Kenya. So don't believe them when they tell you your history did not start until white people discovered Africa. The Swahili language evolved from a mixture of Bantu and Arabic and was the language for trade between the different peoples. And there's a ton of history here that we don't have time to get into. Oh, no. But look it up. Look it (laughs) up. We'll have links yeah. in our show notes so you can look into that more if you want to. Mm-hmm. But in 1885, East Africa was divided into territories by European powers. Here comes the colonialism. Oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> British East Africa, now Kenya, came under the formal control of the British government in 1895. During this time, warring between tribes plus outbreaks of smallpox and cattle disease led to famine and the Kenyan people could offer little resistance. White settlers took root and demanded that the government institute a system that would compel Africans to work for European farmers. Excuse me. Uh, you can't compel me to work for somebody else. I need a lot more to go on. And so they didn't want to. And surprise, surprise, why would they? Yeah. They were yeah, they they've already been living their lives exactly. and then here comes these white people. And the white people want them to work for them. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) Wait, and I'm sorry, you want us to work for you just because your skin is light and because you speak English? And because you so (laughs) confused. Yeah, and because you believe in Catholicism and Christian. I'm so confused. This is this is some bullshit. So (laughs) the British government used taxing as a way to force native Kenyans to find employment with white settlers. If they didn't pay the tax, they would be forced into labor anyway. That is some mafia shit. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah, it is. Because, you know, the only way that they could get money to pay the tax Mm -hmm. would be to work. Is to work. Yeah. 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 Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In addition, unless they were already employed by British settlers, Kenyans had to work for 60 days a year for the government. Native Kenyans were often poorly treated by their European employers with flogging being the punishment of choice. Thousands of Indian laborers were also brought in to construct the Kenya-Uganda railway line. So they just exploited everybody. Everybody, everybody who's yeah. close and All not All the brown white. people. Yeah. White settlers were allowed a voice in government, while the Africans and the Asians were banned from direct political participation. In 1942, members of the Kikuyu, Embu, Meru, and Kamba tribes took an oath of unity and secrecy to fight for freedom from British rule. The Mau Mau Rebellion began with that oath. 
The Mau Mau Rebellion was a war between the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, or KLFA, a.k.a. Mau Mau, and the British authorities. It lasted from 1952 to 1960. Kenya finally gained independence on December 12, 1963, and in 1964, joined the British Commonwealth. I don't know why, but this just reminds me of, remember when the Queen died? Mm -hmm. And Kenya, Kenya Twitter was... Full oh, yeah. of joyful yeah. memes. It was, yeah, I remember it was that. really something to see. <laughs> After independence, many Kenyans migrated from rural to urban areas for greater economic opportunities. The largest coastal city in Kenya is Mombasa, while the majority of Kenyans in the interior live in the capital city, Nairobi. During the first quarter of the 20th century, the total population of Kenya was fewer than 4 million, largely because of famines, war, and disease. By the mid-1980s, the population exceeded 20 million. Wow. This population explosion resulted in limited employment opportunities and rising costs. In traditional Kenyan society, elders are highly respected and taking care of them is a noble duty. But changing family values, rising cost of living and migration into cities or abroad meant that many Kenyans were living away from parents and are unable to fulfill their traditional role of caring for them. This has given rise to old folks' homes, which have actually been unable to cope with the demand. Mm. And as a result, many elderly people are being neglected and abandoned. According to Ugandan scholar and writer Professor Austin Bukenya, in Africa, mention of going to an old people's home or sending a relative there is almost a taboo. Mm. It is taken as a rejection of your family if you consider going there, or a rejection by your family if they hint at the possibility of sending you there. I totally get that. Get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although I, you know, I remember getting punished as a child and uh, saying very low under my breath, you're going in a home, lady. <laughs> <laughs> to my mom. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. Now, let's move over to Dallas, Texas, where these crimes occurred. In the United States, a backlog of cold murder cases keeps growing nationwide. But they still keep giving the police money. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so police departments, including in Dallas, are solving a lower percentage of homicide cases than ever before. Like less than 50 percent. It's awful. In prior decades, police and urban centers often solved as many as 70 percent of murder cases, although how many of those were false convictions yeah, and false arrests? And by the 2000s, many metro police departments regularly solved 60 percent or less. That's an F. Yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> In 2019, four Texas cities, Houston, Arlington, Killeen and Lubbock, cleared 40 percent or less of reported homicides. Oh, boy. Dallas reported a clearance rate of just 54%. Mm. After 40 homicides were reported in just May of that year, so one month, yeah. the highest monthly body count since the 1990s, local advocates requested more detectives and increased oversight. Well, instead, Governor Greg Abbott dispatched Texas DPS troopers who conducted 12,500 traffic stops in seven weeks. Oh That's not how you solve murders. <laughs> anyway, an effort that advocates viewed as unnecessary harassment rather than real help, yeah. right? Yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> yes. You know, if they're going to give them a grade, maybe we can get extra credit by pulling a bunch of people over and yeah, just still ignoring the homicide tickets. rate. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, so stupid. <laughs> Uh -huh. yeah. The Dallas Police Department, which has 3,000 officers and a $500 million annual budget, wow. initially assigned only one homicide detective in 2018 mm. to re-examine the dozens of deaths that might have been linked to Shamir Mir. The detective was initially assigned exclusively to the investigation, but later had to juggle other murder cases. This is ridiculous. Yeah. This is clearly a misallocation of resources. Yeah. In 2018, the department's 16 to 19 homicide detectives handled an average of more than 10 new murder cases each. That's more than twice the recommended caseload, even without extra time for working on older cases. James Adcock, the president of Mid-South Cold Case Initiative, a nonprofit that provides assistance on cold cases, said that Dallas should have kept its detective on the Shamir Mir case full-time 
and much longer, Mm -hmm. given the number of potential victims involved. Attic argues that police reformers should insist that departments refocus on murders and demand answers about the growing backlog of unsolved homicides. Improving results doesn't necessarily require an increase in a police budget. Wow, is anybody listening? (laughs) Um, But rather a shifting of funding to investigative manpower training and forensic tests. Okay. According to a National Institute of Justice report, dedicating even a small amount of funding to forensic testing can make a huge difference. A cold case DNA grant program from 2005 to 2014 led to the resolution of 2,000 cases, Mm. and solving just one case can link more crimes to the same killer. And just why does there have to be a grant? Uh, They have 500 million. Million. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. Okay, well, let's get into Chamir Mir's early life. So Billy Kip Courier Chamir Mir was born on December 8th, 1972 in Kabunyoni Village in Eldama Ravine, Baringo, Kenya, a rural area between the major cities of Eldoret and Nakuru. His father, Joel Tamir Mir, was a long-serving senior colonial chief in the village and was very famous in the area in his heyday. A neighbor said that his father was, quote, a very good man who lived well with people, unquote. Polygamy is common among traditional communities in Kenya, and Joel Shamir Mir had three wives. Billy was the eighth of nine children from Joel's second wife, but he had a total of 29 children. Whoa, that's a lot of kids. I would argue too many. Too many. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, I'm thinking of an African rapper who I enjoy. His name is Jadena. Well, his dad is African. And he talks about how his grandfather had seven wives. Wow. And he would he's seen pictures of his grandfather with the women and none of them looked happy. Aww. Which is, it's just interesting. Yeah. I always think about that when I think about these multi-partner uh, relationships. Yeah. Right. But I don't know, because I'm not in them. So I'm not here to relationship shame. Anyway, sometime after Billy's birth, Joel relocated to Kamandu Farm in Solai, Nakuru County, where Billy and his siblings grew up. Billy went to school in Nakuru, where he said he was generally well-liked and a good student, especially in math. After completing high school, he moved back to Kabunyoni, where he lived with his maternal grandmother. According to an elder who grew up with Billy's older brothers, the Shamirmir family had no history of violence, and Billy was never accused of committing any crime in Kenya. He never engaged in quarrels and was generally liked by his neighbors. Billy has been described by his friends and neighbors in Kabunyoni as a quiet and humble introvert who mostly kept to himself. Villagers said that Billy spent most of his time drinking at local bars in the nearby town of Eldama Ravine. At some point, Billy became engaged to a woman and relocated to Bonini Estate in Nakuru. They had one child. But Billy and two of his brothers overindulged in alcohol while staying in Bondeni Estate. Their two older sisters had emigrated to the U.S. and were operating several senior living homes in McKinney and Allen in North Texas. And I have to note, no suspicious deaths have been reported at these facilities. Also, that's exciting. I mean, yeah. for immigrants to come to the United States and start businesses, business. yeah. that's the American dream. Way yeah. to go. So the sisters secured visas for their three brothers, who they worried were wasting their lives away. Jamirmir's brothers went to the U.S., and he followed a year later in 2003. They all went to work at their sister's nursing homes. Jamirmir worked as a caregiver and also sold cars. Some years later, Jamirmir broke ties with his sisters and opted to offer his services to the elderly at their homes. He would charge $20 to $30 an hour to take care of elderly people all over North Texas. Okay, so he's pulling a Beyonce to say bye to Desky's <laughs> child, and he's going out on his own. Doing his own thing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. In 2004, Chamir Mir married an American woman in Denton County, and he achieved permanent resident status. His wife filed for divorce two years later, saying she didn't know where he was. She tried calling family members and previous employers and searched for him online but couldn't track him down. The divorce was finalized in October of 2006. In the U.S., those who knew him said he lived a life of exclusion. A Kenyan man who knew him said, quote, he didn't want to mix with other Kenyans in Plano, and he rarely attended Kenyan functions, unquote. 
That's interesting. Yeah. Shamir Mir used his caregiving experience to gain access to senior retirement communities. He targeted older residents living alone without assistance. Shamir Mir, who isn't a licensed nurse, had been known to use the name Benjamin Koitaba when finding work. A woman who said she worked with him in Dallas said he used his cousin's name and social security number when applying for jobs. So now let's dive into the timeline. Spish splash. What do you got, Beth? In December of 2010, Shamir Mir was arrested for a DWI in Addison, Texas. And in June 2011, he was sentenced to 180 days in jail and fined $1,250. Just months later, he was arrested again on a DWI charge in Dallas. He didn't show up for court and ended up with a warrant for his arrest. Uh-oh. The following year, Dallas police responded to a disturbance call shortly after 3 a.m. on July 29, 2012. Jeremy Amir's girlfriend told Dallas police he had come home drunk from a strip club and the two argued. She later went to bed and tried to go to sleep, but Shamir came into the room and began punching her. Oh, He then grabbed a small pot and hit her in the back of the head with it <gasps> and also kicked her in the back. Whoa. Then he started stabbing a love seat with a knife. Whoa. He's, he's wilding out. Wow, he yeah. is. His girlfriend called 911 and he was arrested. He pleaded guilty in exchange for a 70-day sentence in the Dallas County Jail. Early in 2016, Shamir Mir was spotted on the property of Edgemere, a high-end senior living complex in Dallas. Um, isn't Dallas a show about rich people who yes, are in the oil yeah, business? Yeah, from the, okay. what, 80s? Yeah. Yeah, but I never watched it, so. Oh, okay. I was hoping I you know could tell me it. more about I know, the, it was a soap the opera. elite of Dallas. Nah, it was uh, a soap the opera. The real was, housewives um... of Dallas. <laughs> Uh, she's just jealous. <laughs> so when confronted, he gave his name as Benjamin Koitaba and was told to leave. Dallas police instructed the staff to call back if he trespassed again. On April 7th, 2016, Catherine Sinclair, 87, was found deceased in her Edgemere room. On May 14th, 2016, Phyllis Payne, 91, was found deceased. A large cache of jewelry that she kept in a coffee can in the fridge was missing. Mm. On June 5th, 2016, Phoebe Perry, 94, was found deceased. Okay, that's three in a very short period of time. Yeah. On June 18th, 2016, Edgemere staff called police and said the suspicious man was back. Chamirmir showed officers his wallet, which had IDs for Benjamin Koitaba and Billy Chamirmir. He was charged with criminal trespass and was sentenced to 70 days in county jail, but was released on good behavior after just 12. What about the dead bodies? Nobody <laughs> asked any questions? Nobody asked, no. <laughs> oh, boy. Shamir Mir then started hanging out at the Tradition Prestonwood in far north Dallas, another retirement community. On July 18th, 2016, eight days after he was released from jail, Joyce Abramowitz, 82, was found deceased. On July 31st, 2016, Juanita Purdy, 83, was found deceased in her fourth floor apartment at the Tradition Preston Wood. Juanita Purdy and her friends who lived on the fourth floor were known as the party girls <laughs> because they celebrated every occasion they could with a party. They even hosted weekly happy hours, living their best life in retirement. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Ooh, Me goals. too. <laughs> On July 31st, Juanita was supposed to be attending a seven-course dinner at the Tradition Prestonwood, mm. which, you know, all these activities they have for these people, it sounded like a lot of fun. It, it sounds really yeah. fun. Yeah. See, Mom? <laughs> and Juanita had been very excited about the seven-course dinner. So when she didn't show up, her friends started to worry and asked the front desk to have somebody conduct a wellness check. And Juanita was found dead in her room. Mm. The family of Juanita Purdy was told she died peacefully in her sleep, but they became skeptical when they found the morning newspaper and a full cup of tea in her apartment. She was also missing about $27,000 worth of jewelry, including her wedding ring. 83-year-old tradition Prestonwood resident Leah Corkin, who also lived on the fourth floor, told her daughter, quote, they're dropping like flies around here. I don't know what's going on, unquote. Mm. Oh my Less God. than a month later, Leah was dead. Whoa. So she yeah. was found face down on the floor of her apartment on August 19th, 2016. Her wedding ring was also missing. When Leah's daughter questioned the way that she was laying on the floor, which she thought was unnatural, 
The staff assured her that that was the way that people fall when they die. <laughs> okay. Oh, man. The patrolman who arrived seemed uninterested in the missing ring or the passing of another elderly resident. On August 28, 2016, Margaret White, 86, was found dead. On October 1st, 2016, Solomon Spring, 89, was found dead. Hmm. Solomon, the only male victim connected to Shamir Mir, had a gash on the back of his head and a bloody lamp was on the floor nearby. Hmm. He was found in a pool of so much blood that the tradition Preston would had to remove the carpet in his bedroom and a homicide detective was called to the scene. Now get this. Police were told he was on blood thinners, which may have accounted for the blood. They marked it as a natural death at the time oh, God. and suggested he slipped and hit his head. Maintenance tools were found in Solomon's apartment, although no maintenance had been requested. That's ridiculous. I know, but the elderly being on blood thinners and fall risk is a consideration. But yeah. normally the... <laughs> Death doesn't result in a gaping gash. Yeah, you know, the, and a bloody lamp on the a floor. A bloody lamp on the floor, right. It and might be like a hematoma. Strange, yeah. strange tools in the apartment that nobody exactly. knows where they came from. Exactly. Yeah. It's almost like the police showed up to these homicide scenes knowing that their homicide solve rate is an F. And we're like, yeah. I think I'm going to yeah. try to get my score even lower. Yeah, it's, it's Case natural. closed. Yeah. yeah. Norma French, 85, also lived at Tradition Prestonwood. In early October, she returned from a trip to see her daughter and family. On October 8, 2016, Norma was found dead in her room. Her wedding ring was missing. She was known to have $600 in cash, which was also missing. Her daughter noticed blood on the carpet and other jewelry missing. She met with staff and told them that Norma's ring had been stolen off of her finger. She was told that there had been two prior deaths where wedding rings went missing, and the other families suspect the paramedics. Norma French's family followed up with police about the missing jewelry. Police told them that they didn't believe that any of the Dallas workers stole the jewelry, and they suspected that it was an inside job and described it as fishy. However, however, mm. <laughs> <laughs> however, <laughs> however, the Dallas Police Department closed the case huh. without identifying the culprit or recognizing a pattern in the robberies and deaths. Wow. So they really didn't, they didn't do give a shit. Yeah. anything. Yeah. October 15th, 2016, the same day of Norma French's memorial service, Glenna Day, 87, was found dead in her bed in her tradition Prestonwood apartment. Glenna was an artist and would sometimes paint on the patio of her apartment. She was found lying on top of the comforter on her bed, still in her artist's smock with paint on her hands. Her Rolex watch and cash were missing. Her family knew that she'd never lay down on that comforter, which she treated very delicately. Oh. She even she would pull it down to the bottom of the bed before she'd get in. Like she oh. just never she always took care of that comforter. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. And so they knew her habits and they knew that she wouldn't lay down on that, especially still in her painting smock with paint on her hands. It did, yeah. didn't make sense to them. On October 29th, 2016, Doris Gleason, 92, was found deceased, lying near the dining room table in her apartment at Tradition Prestonwood. Doris always wore her guardian angel gold necklace, even when she went to sleep each night. Her daughter, Shannon Gleason Dion, wore an identical one around her own neck. Doris's necklace was missing. Also missing was some cash, rings, and other jewelry. Shannon's husband, Eric Dion, called 911. A homicide detective arrived and dusted for fingerprints. At least they dusted for fingerprints. Hey. The officers filed a theft report and ordered an autopsy. Months later, the state of Texas declared Doris Gleason had died of natural causes. What? Yeah. Oh, man, another failed opportunity. Yep. Not satisfied with what the authorities had told her, Shannon was determined to investigate further. She filed a request with the Dallas Police Department asking for two years worth of police reports on the tradition Prestonwood. The records arrived in the mail after many weeks. Shannon found reports of a string of unaccompanied deaths followed by complaints of missing jewelry, cash, and other valuables, suspicious person reports, and break-ins. Shout out to Shannon. Yeah. So Shannon found that in November, 13 days after Doris's death, there was a report of a suspicious person on the property, a black man carrying a leather satchel. 
According to the police report, the man, quote, has been seen on numerous occasions visiting the fourth floor and has stated he was there to check for pipe leaks, unquote. The responding officer walked to the fourth floor but didn't find the man. Before leaving, the officer told staff to tighten security. Shannon was convinced that someone was sneaking into people's apartments after they died and taking jewelry and other precious items. She wanted someone to know, so she emailed a reporter at the Dallas Morning News. She sent the packet of documents in a manila envelope, but nobody followed up with her for an interview. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You would think that they would have at least called her or something. Yeah. Yeah. The suspicious deaths at Tradition Prestonwood stopped after the report of the suspicious man in November. Hmm. The known attacks resumed on October 29, 2017, at the Senior Living Community Parkview in Frisco, when a 93-year-old female was attacked in her home by a black male. The woman had opened the door to find a well-dressed man who said he was a maintenance worker. The man pushed her from her walker and put a pillow over her face, muffling her screams. I guess he thought he killed her, and he Mm. got up, rifled through the apartment, taking jewelry, and then left. She was able to activate her emergency alert button and received aid from caretakers. She survived. On October 31st, 2017, Minnie Campbell, 84, was found deceased at Plano's Preston Place Apartments. On December 31st, 2017, Carolyn McPhee, 81, was found deceased in her Plano home. It was later discovered that Shamir Mir had worked for the family in the home as an in-home health care provider for Carolyn's husband, Jack, leading up to Jack's death in April of 2017. Mm. Carolyn's son, Scott McPhee, said they knew him as Benjamin Koitaba, who he described as aloof. Six months after they lost their father, the McPhee's sons discovered their mother dead at home. They found her broken glasses on a counter near her body. There was blood in the bathroom, in the garage, near her body, and even on her glasses. Officers collected no samples of the blood, nor did they take photos or videos. No autopsy was ordered. Jewelry was missing, including her wedding ring. Scott McPhee reported the theft to a detective. The detective's explanation was, quote, old people hide their stuff, unquote. Okay, the, the police need to go to jail because this is egregious. This is criminal. This, yeah. I can't believe this. The medical examiner determined that Carolyn died of natural causes and suggested that she'd probably gone out to her car and had a nosebleed because she was having an aneurysm and had blood on her hands. Wow. Yeah. You know, the yeah. medical examiners can be on it. They don't know shit. Be inept too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I can't say all of them. But not yeah, all of them. A lot, but some, a lot of them. They don't know what they're They're all working doing. in concert, right? They yeah. all have access to the same budget. And if they're continuing to get their departments funded and no, no corrective measures are taken when there is issues then they can continue to do what they're doing. And this medical examiner is, I think, included in that. Eh, It's just an old person. Let's just close the case. Yeah. And medical examiners, aren't they elected or something? Some some jurisdictions, they're elected. Sometimes they they can be a person with not a a lot of medical training. It doesn't have to be an MD necessarily in some jurisdictions. Yeah. It's nuts. That's nuts to me. Yes, it is. Yeah. Can I be a medical examiner? I'm a <laughs> podcaster. I talk about death a lot. Vote for sure. me. <laughs> Emmy Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes, I can see it now. <laughs> so Carolyn's family kept her glasses. They were going to give them to charity, but they just hadn't. On the glasses Carolyn was wearing when she died was some blood. Much later, when Shamir Mir became a suspect, Scott gave them to police who ran a DNA test and it came back as a positive match for Shamir Mir. Finally. Thank you. Thank you, DNA. (laughs) Oh, my God. I'm so happy to see you. So in 2017, there were also reports of unattended deaths of four other women. Marilyn Bixler, 90. Diane Dela Hunty, 79. Helen Lee, 82. And Mammy Maya, 93. On January 19, 2018, Rosemary Curtis, 76, was found deceased in her Dallas home. Also in January of 2018, a woman named Ann Brooks was becoming concerned about why her mother, Mary Brooks, 87, 
was not answering her calls. After failing to get her on the phone for a second day, Anne asked her son, David Cudahy, to check on his grandmother at her Richardson apartment since she lived near him. When David arrived at his grandmother's house on January 31st, he found her deceased. The door was open, lights were on, and full grocery bags had been left untouched. Grocery receipts showed that Mary had shopped at Walmart the day before her body was found. Surveillance video from the store showed a vehicle leaving just after Mary, going in the same direction, and it matched the description of Tremere's car. In March of 2018, there were four unattended deaths at Preston Place in Plano, Texas. Martha Williams, 80, on March 4th, Miriam Nelson, 81, on March 9th, and Ann Conklin, 82, on March 18th. But unlike some of the other victims, police determined that Ann had likely been murdered. On March 19th, 2018, Mary Anise Bartell, 91, had just arrived home to her apartment at Preston Place after shopping at Walmart when someone knocked on her door. She opened the door, but the minute she saw a man at the door wearing green rubber gloves, she knew she was in quote-unquote grave danger. He pushed his way in and commanded that she, quote, go to the bed, don't fight me, unquote. She lay down on the bed and the man placed a pillow over her face to smother her. She lost consciousness. Luckily, one of Mary's friends came to visit and found her unconscious. Plano paramedics revived her and she told investigators what had happened. A diamond ring and wedding band were missing from her left hand and $270 in cash was gone. Police looked for similar incidents and found the one from Parkview Elderly Assisted Living in Frisco on October 29, 2017, when the 93-year-old woman had been pushed from her walker by a man who tried to smother her with a pillow. To the cops, the attacks on the woman in Frisco and the woman in Plano seemed too similar to be a coincidence. Finally. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You, you did it. Uh, no <laughs> round of applause, though. So police found a report of a suspicious vehicle, a silver Nissan Altima, at the Plano Senior Living Complex. The same car was connected to a trespassing charge from two years earlier at a Dallas senior living complex. Its owner, Billy Chamirmir. Police showed the Frisco woman a photo lineup. She was pretty sure that Chamirmir was, in fact, her attacker. So now we're going to get into the investigation and the arrest. Hit it, Beth! The next day, detectives began surveillance on Chamirmir outside of his Dallas apartment. There, police observed him throwing things into a dumpster in the parking lot of his apartment complex. Detectives approached him and arrested him for outstanding warrants. He was holding jewelry and cash. And in the dumpster, the officers found a large red jewelry box containing jewelry and a paper on which was written a woman's name, Lou T. Harris. Mary Bartell's children later positively identified the jewelry box as belonging to their mother. Police conducted a welfare check on the Dallas residence of Lou T. Harris. After no response, officers forced their way into the home and found Lou T. 81 deceased. A pillow on the bed was smeared with lipstick. Chamir Mir was taken to Dallas Police Headquarters and interrogated. Investigators then executed a search warrant and discovered more valuables in his home that belonged to other victims. Shamir Mir claimed to have bought Mary Bartell's jewelry box on the internet. <laughs> he said that he had offer up in Craigslist accounts, which he used to sell jewelry, but that he didn't do anything illegal. Hmm. However, he could not explain where he got all that jewelry from. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> During their investigation, police found evidence of Shamir Mir selling stolen pieces of jewelry even before the women who owned them were found dead. What? <laughs> A jewelry broker from Diamond and Gold Exchange later testified that he bought $91,000 worth wow. of jewelry. Yeah. From Tremere Mir between 2015 and 2018. Whoa. Whoa. And wow. it says 2015 and 2018. And the murders we're covering are between 2016 and 2018. So there could have been Others. some earlier ones as Holy. well. Holy. Yeah. I'm sure there's a lot more. I think so, too. I think so, too, especially given the population and how vulnerable it was and how just death isn't a surprise when people are at that stage in their lives. And so, yeah, yeah, there were probably a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. Security camera footage showed Shamir Mir following women around and out of Walmart just before they were killed. And cell phone data showed that his device was at the site of nearly every death. (gasps) The deaths of all the women were also tied to missing jewelry, cash, or other items. 
Got him. <laughs> so police began to review any accompanied death that lined up with a report of missing jewelry. Eventually, Chamir Mir was indicted on 22 separate murder charges. He was also charged with the attempted murders of the surviving victims in Frisco and Plano. The case shocked Kenyans living in Dallas, a city that has a high concentration of Kenyans. Mm. But many who were approached by reporters were reluctant to comment on it. Mm. A prominent Kenyan community leader living in Plano said the case was, quote, a big stain on the reputation of the Kenyan community in Texas. That's the reason no Kenyan wants to talk about it, unquote. Oh, yeah. And again, this comes up a lot on Fruit Loops is yep. that when somebody from an underrepresented group does something really bad, the entire group feels a responsibility yeah. to what that person did. And the entire community is often vilified or under attack, yeah. under attack or stereotypes are reinforced. And it's not the same for straight white males who not at all. No, historically, <laughs> statistically, <laughs> um, did all the yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm not surprised by that one bit. A Kenyan attorney living in Dallas commented that right-wing media channels were using Chamimir's case to urge the Trump administration to clamp down on immigration. Yep, yep. of course they did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In nearly every case associated with Shamirmir, Dallas police failed to follow standard death and homicide investigation procedures published by the U.S. Department of Justice and other organizations. Both national and international guidelines recommend that forensic tests are appropriate, when there are indications of criminal activity at a death scene, like the theft of jewelry. Oh, really? Um, yeah. Yeah, you would think <laughs> they might learn that at detective school or good police thing. school. <laughs> Maybe that $500 million that they get every Maybe year that, could what be is that used. place they're building in Atlanta, the cop uh, shop? Cop City? <laughs> cop City. Yeah, the cop shop. Yeah, the cop shop. <laughs> <laughs> You guys want cops so bad, like I said, have them live in your neighborhood. Get out of mine. So the case was hampered by the fact that most of the murders were initially investigated as potential homicides. Detectives failed to take photos, no way, or videos, and no footage of any of the bodies, as investigation guidelines recommended, or to collect samples to test for blood or fingerprints potentially left by an intruder. Most of the victims were never even autopsied. Mm -mm. Whoa. Yeah. That's shocking. Yeah. And Dr. Jeffrey Bernard, chief medical examiner for Dallas County, admitted that his office almost never orders autopsies for seniors. Mm. Instead, thousands of unattended deaths that the office receives each year are handled by phone even if the cases involve robberies or burglaries. Mm. He claimed that otherwise the workload would be too overwhelming. Well, gosh, that might be, maybe you guys can take some you of the police budget. Yeah. yeah. Take some of that $500 million and use it to do more autopsies. Yeah. Just an idea. Just, just a thought. I'm just a, a lowly podcaster. <laughs> Don't listen to me. Now it's time to get into the trial. So Chamir Mir pleaded not guilty to the charges while he was still being investigated for hundreds of unsolved deaths. Wow, they were investigating for hundreds? His bail was set at $11.6 million, and he remained in jail. No way he's coming up with that 10%. <laughs> Dallas prosecutors decided not to seek the death penalty against Tremir Mir. Interesting. Which surprised me. Texas? Are yeah, you okay Texas. over there? <laughs> And yeah, they investigated something like 750 um, wow. deaths. Yeah. Wow. It was crazy. Oh my. He was brought to trial for the murder of Lutie Harris on November 15th, 2021. Mary Bartell, the woman who survived her attack, died in 2020. Mm. But before she died, she described the attack on a taped interview that was played at Shamir Mir's trial. Yeah, she would have been such a compelling witness had she yeah. been able to testify in the courtroom but uh, you know unfortunately At least they she did got pass it away on uh tape yeah. they, yes absolutely so wow wait a minute <laughs> so they did get something on tape yeah that she the was the one that was attacked and survived she's the one that her attack led to his capture yeah ah yes 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 yeah. yes got it okay so jurors were deadlocked 11 to 1 after two days of deliberations and a mistrial was declared. 
Jameer Mir remained in jail until his second trial, which began on April 25th, 2022. On April 28th, he was convicted of capital murder in the murder of 81-year-old Lou T. Harris and sentenced to life in prison without parole. I was just trying to... <laughs> you, you're if using I ever get news, jury newscaster duty, voice. Yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. And was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Parole. <laughs> I'm, I can come back anytime and speak for whoever you need me to. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> On October 3rd, 2022, he was tried for the murder of 87-year-old Mary Brooks. On October 7th, he was found guilty and received another sentence of life without parole. After his convictions, the remaining charges against Shamir Mir were dismissed, which disappointed many of the other victims' families. Yeah. Which I understand Mm -hmm. why they did Mm -hmm. that, because, you know, he's spending the rest of his life in jail. Yeah. But still, I think the family members still want to see justice for their for their loved ones. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, it opens up a conversation about what could justice look like if he is in jail and they're not going to bring additional charges. What are DAs doing to reframe the discussion of what justice looks like with the victims and the victims' families? Yeah. Because sometimes it isn't a trial. Sometimes it isn't jail. Sometimes it could be something else. We just need to reimagine how we do all of this. Yeah. Anyway, off the soapbox, where are they now? (laughs) Well, I'll tell you. So some of the family members of the victims who lived at Tradition Prestonwood filed lawsuits against the facility where eight people had died. Oh, yeah. I wonder if that place is even still in business. <laughs> the relatives alleged that the complex failed to protect residents and that they tried to hide the string of suspicious deaths. They also alleged that tradition employees were not forthcoming about the series of deaths at the facility and that gave authorities, quote, a skewed, incomplete lens, unquote, which allowed suspicious activity to be overlooked. The lawsuits alleged that after Tremere Mir was arrested, one family asked a tradition Prestonwood employee whether Tremere Mir had ever been at the complex. According to the suits, the employee said, quote, no, never, unquote. Mm. But that same employee had escorted Tremere Mir off the premises years earlier. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's not good. No. The lawsuits also said that the complex had conducted an internal investigation of Shamir Mir and identified him on security footage long before Plano police arrested him. Oh, really? The suits claimed, quote, the tradition's nearly singular focus on increasing its bottom line at the expense of its residents' safety enabled Shamir Mir to exploit the tradition Prestonwood as a highly accessible environment full of the easiest targets imaginable incredibly vulnerable elderly residents, unquote. Yep. I mean, that's that's yep. the whole case right there. Yep. But Texas Appeals Court ruled that an arbitration agreement signed by residents who subsequently were the victims of a serial killer covered the wrongful death and survival claims made by their families. Whoa. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so they, they can't get compensated. No. Wow. The family of one of Shamir Mir's suspected victims settled a lawsuit against Edgemere in 2019. Preston Place Retirement Community in Plano, Texas, where seven of the suspected murders occurred, also faced lawsuits. The McPhee family sued their home health care provider, Griswold Home Care of Plano, who they say should have known about Shamir Mir's criminal history. That case settled. Along with the lawsuits, in response to the series of murders, a bipartisan group of Texas lawmakers introduced several bills intended to protect senior citizens by improving senior security and changing death certificate procedures. Shannon Gleason Dion, the daughter of Doris Gleason, Lauren Adair, the daughter of Phyllis Payne, M.G. Jennings, the daughter of Leah Corkin, and Ellen French House, the daughter of Norma French, formed a tight bond. The four stay in touch constantly and are focused on lobbying for new laws for the protection of senior citizens. Together with other sons and daughters of the victims, they started a foundation called Secure Our Seniors Safety. I think that's really wonderful. It is. And it uh, warms my heart that they found each other in a strong connection. Yeah. And a new purpose. Yeah. Something meaningful out of something so tragic.
So now we're going to get into our takeaways and what we think made Shamir Mir snap. What are your thoughts, Beth? Well, he obviously didn't value the lives of these elderly people. Right. Yeah. Right. Which I, I find odd since in the traditional Kenyan culture, elders oh, are revered. Right. And it makes me wonder what was it about these victims that made him feel that he could devalue them and just treat them as a means to get what he wanted? Yeah. Was it because they were American? Because they were most of them were white or yeah. well off? Because these were upscale facilities, yeah. most of them. Yeah. I wonder the same thing. Yeah. I just don't know. Yeah. Well, I don't know either, but those were my thoughts also. And in the history section, we talked about how in Kenya, if you're placed in an old folks home, it's considered a rejection by your family. So did he just consider these people as rejected and mm. therefore not valuable? Again, mm. I don't know. <laughs> just Very, you're getting so deep today. Yeah, just, oh, just stuff to think about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another thought that I had is that Shamir Mir came from a very large family. He had eight siblings from his mother. But a total of 28 siblings. Yeah. In traditional Kenyan culture, this was probably not a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that the people in the communities took care of each other. It, mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. it takes a village, all that yeah. stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. But after colonization and the breakdown of their society, I wonder how many kids got basically left behind. Mm. Yeah. 20 kids is a lot of kids. And if you're not, you know, if you don't have. Well your, off. Yeah. Not well off. If you don't mm -hmm. have your community to mm -hmm. help you raise those kids, you know, you can't give your attention to 29 people. <laughs> you just yeah. Can't. Oh, I know. Yeah. Oh, I know. I don't know how yeah. Nick Cannon does it. <laughs> yeah. It's a yeah. lot of kids. Mm -hmm. He also seemed to have a problem with alcohol and he did not have any good relationships with other people that I read about. Yeah. Like none. Yeah, none, like none. none at all. <laughs> Even in Kenya, he was described as spending most of his time drinking Mm -hmm. And nobody said they were his friend, you know? Yeah, yeah. He got DUIs or mm -hmm. DWIs, whatever, in mm -hmm. Texas. Mm -hmm. When people talked about him, he was just like some guy I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> nobody I've said, seen him oh, before. my good yeah. friend. Yeah, right. No. Yeah. And he worked for his sisters for a time, but eventually went his own way. He didn't want to be a part of the Kenyan community in Dallas. And it makes me think maybe he was incapable of forming human connections. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Thinking about it more, he really didn't have a person or no. people. I mean, he got married, but it sounded like it was a uh, convenience so that he could yeah. get permanent residency. And then he just like took off. <laughs> yeah. From my experience of being a kid of an immigrant, my understanding is that coming here is exciting, that mm -hmm. it's for a better life. That right. things are going to be better, easier, more opportunities. And perhaps he was disappointed by yeah. the fact that the, that the reality. It, it, yeah. The streets are not paved with gold. What? <laughs> and I can imagine that that would also be jarring to move, but also your expectations not being met when you yeah. get here. And it seemed to me like he just couldn't find his footing or his drive. No. Like he was like a rolling stone. Yeah. And he just, you know, we all, we all had that like cousin or friend who goes from couch to couch. Sometimes they go to work. Sometimes they don't. But they're never like bothered by it because they're yeah. drunk or high all the time. Right. <laughs> that's right. That's what should be. That's what I thought of. Yeah. And I also considered the scarcity like in his background being from Kenya and just the isolation that he may have felt culturally living and working in the United States right. might have also been difficult, even though he did have Kenyan community. He had an opportunity. He, exactly. Yeah. He had an opportunity. But perhaps that discomfort contributed to his drinking. Yeah. And you know how like uh, when you go to buy something and then they're like, hey, we're going to just throw in this free hot, gooey chocolate chip cookie. Mm. And you weren't expecting it. But boy, oh, boy. You're not mad about it. And so I wonder <laughs> if that's like what happened at first. Like he went to go rob somebody vulnerable and they died. And he was like, this is the like murder got thrown movie. in. I wasn't expecting it, <laughs> but I'm not mad about it because I'll probably get away with it because these are older people who are closer to death than I am anyway. So yeah. what's the big deal? Obviously, it didn't bother him at all. Exactly. Yeah. And I don't know if he enjoyed it as much as a chocolate chip cookie, but <laughs> but it's it's possible. What did I say? 
say that. I don't, I don't know. know. That's what I was thinking. I just, but I mean, you're right, Beth. That is almost what it was like to him. Like as trivial as yeah. somebody's life was as trivial as a ooey gooey chocolate chip cookie. Right. right. And that is disgusting. Yes. But also his victims were elderly, as we said, towards the end of their life. And it wasn't necessarily a cause for alarm bells that their lives ended right when they were in right. their 90s and 80s. But the case opens up, I think, a, a conversation. Feel free to come to our discussion group or get at us on Twitter. But about the care we provide to people in the United States yeah. and how caring for people, whether it's elderly people or kids, is it's one of those occupations that's like feminized. Yeah. Like we, this is women's work. Women's so work. Yeah. It's devalued and the pay is not very much for people who provide care. And the benefits are not very much. People aren't paid what they deserve and they don't pay. Uh, they're not paid living wages. Plus, there are these facilities like the ones we mentioned in the story that the perception and sometimes the truth is profits are more important than people. Yeah. And that's why this happens so much. There's legislation like in Arizona. It was APSA, Adult Protective Services Act. I don't know what it is in other states, but now there's laws to protect elderly, vulnerable adults. But anyway, I just think it's a conversation worth having how these are human beings who are worthy of care and dignity, but that also requires people to do that job. And they also require living wages and yeah. dignity as well. Yeah, so for sure. Everybody failed in this system. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> everybody the facilities, the police, the medical examiners. Yeah. It, if it wasn't for those family members who just wouldn't drop it, who knows what would have happened? Yeah. How, how much longer Tremere would have gone on? Right. Anything else on nope. the thoughts? All nope. right. Well, let's talk about how not to get murdered. <clears throat> and so, if you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. So before we started recording, I asked chat GPT how not to get murdered. And it said, this is a very serious question. <laughs> Basically, ChatGPT said, head on a swivel. <laughs> but I'm thinking about the story and it has occurred to me that some of these victims were followed home yes. after shopping at Going Walmart. to the grocery store. It's a yeah. big department store. You leave, somebody's asking to check your receipt. You're trying to get to your car, maybe not paying attention. Maybe you got headphones on jamming to your car, listening to Fruit Loops, and somebody's following you and you don't even notice. So head on a swivel, right? If you're being followed, do not get in your car and drive home. Drive to another public place. And you just got to be paying attention. And people who are not paying attention are pretty easy to spot. Yeah. So don't be one of them is my tip. Well, I like it. Do you have anything to add? Nope. So that, that was a good one. Thank you. Really? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always surprised when people it. say nice things to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so now it's shout out time where we shout out any content by or about any people of color, marginalized folks or any true crime goodies. I okay. just wanted to shout out Dead Ringers on Amazon Prime. Hmm. There are six episodes. Okay. It is creepy. It is very disturbing. But it, yeah. well, I loved it. And, okay. you know, Rach Rachel Weiss. She, yes, I uh, love her. Yes, I love her too. She plays twins. One of the twins is a lesbian. And there's more than one compelling BIPOC character who isn't just like a sidekick right. or the magical Negro. Yeah. They are complex BIPOC characters. So I really nice. appreciate that. It's based on a book. I think it's there's also a movie from the 80s. Yeah, Didn't I watched watch the it. movie. It was very disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I'll it say. Was Jer Jeremy Irons uh, played the yeah. twins. Yeah, so I heard movie, of that guy. Yeah, it was a male Two male twins. And really? so this one, yeah, okay. they, they twisted it. And now it's oh, two, okay. two female twins. Twisted indeed. They're trying <laughs> to change the way that women give birth. So they're both OBGYNs, like the best of the best. My favorite part was they threw some shade 
at the alleged founder of gynecology, you know, right. J. Marion Sims. Yeah. And there's a monologue within the six episodes given by an actress portraying that one of the enslaved women who he operated on more than 30 times over mm. five years without anesthesia. That's so it's, it is really, uh, I was like surprised by how much I loved it. So well, good. check that out. Exciting. Oh yeah. What do you got? Um, so I just wanted to shout out the Perfect Scam podcast, Ooh. and it's an AARP podcast. What? Yeah, I didn't know they did that. I know, <laughs> Grandma. So, did so a lot that? of <laughs> so I'm a member of the AARP because I'm an older you person. You are, yeah. Oh my God. You can oh. join when you're 55. You can, and, yeah, and you get um, discounts, discounts and stuff? on, yeah, discounts oh. and stuff, and nice. they send you a magazine, and Ooh. you get get emails, and they tell you all kinds of stuff, interesting wow. information, and uh, people always laugh about it, but it's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> you wait, <laughs> laugh at what? Being a part of ARP. Yeah, being a part of AARP, because as you get older, people just think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's and not. You're I saying it's not. No, I'm, I'm saying when people and I'm also saying when people as you get older, they just make fun of, they, you know, they're always making fun of old people. Yeah. And uh, yeah. kind of sucks. And so I thought about that a lot as I was researching this script that uh -huh. uh, how much people discriminate against old people or make fun of old people you're it's right. not cool we're all yeah. gonna get old you you're know you're right yeah and uh aarp is not funny <laughs> <laughs> stop laughing at me <laughs> shut face <laughs> so um anyway i i went on a soapbox there i for a minute. love it when you do that hey you okay <laughs> up there on your soapbox friend <laughs> yeah yeah i'm okay <laughs> okay okay <laughs> i used to do it too you know, <laughs> so I understand. Yeah. Karma's a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's an AARP podcast and they tell okay. stories of people who find themselves the target of a scam uh -huh. and talk to people who have experienced scams firsthand, oh. as well as professional con artists and experts <gasps> on how scammers operate. Oh, and no they way. have a four part series on this story that I listened to called The Perfect Scam Presents a Special Report on the Texas Elder Murders. Wow. So, mm. Oh my gosh. Wow. Okay. That wait, can you listen if you're not a member of ARP? Yeah, it's on it's on all the It's wherever you get your podcast? Yep. yep. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you needed like a special ARP like no. code. A special no, everybody ARP. can listen to it. Well, look at that. Yeah. Here we go. Mm -hmm. Subscribed. <laughs> so that's Dead Ringers on Amazon Prime, as well as The Perfect Scam, wherever you get your podcasts. Oh, look at that. Well, We're here. am I hallucinating or are we nope. at the end of the episode? We're at the end. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, well, okay. Uh, well, that's it. Um, <laughs> Beth, can you tell the people where to find us? Yeah, our website is fruitloopspod.com. And we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five star review. Yeah, yeah. that's true. <laughs> and you know what else is true? This is what a else? weekly podcast. And let me tell you something new episodes drop. Every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there.
Okay, here we go. Party girls. <laughs> Hang on a diddly doggone minute. Texas? Are yeah, you okay Texas. over there? <laughs> this is a very serious question. <laughs> What about the dead bodies? <laughs> the cop, uh, cop City? Cop City. Yeah, the cop shop. Yeah, the cop shop. <laughs> you guys want cops so bad. Like I said, have them live in your neighborhood. Get out of mine. 60% or less. That's an F. Yeah. <laughs> it is. I think I'm going to try to get my score even lower. Can I be a medical examiner? Emmy Wendy. Oh, That's my God. not... How you solve murders. <laughs> anyway. Like, what the fuck? Look it up. Yeah. Look it yeah. up. All of a sudden, my mouth froze. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, so he's pulling a Beyonce. Never <laughs> eat sucky waffles. And I'm like, oh, East. Got it. Okay, so the petroleum, the patrolman. The petroleum. <laughs> the petroleum jelly man. <laughs> that was gross. <laughs> Whoops. Whoopsies. Oh, whoop. I'm fired. That's it. Stop the recording. Bye. AARP is not funny. <laughs> Stop laughing at me. Shut face. Life in prison without parole. I was just trying to. <laughs> you, you're using if I ever that get news, jury duty, voice. Yeah, that's how I'm going to do it. And was sentenced Your to Honor? life in prison without parole. Parole. <laughs> I'm, I can come back anytime and speak for whoever you need me to. Thank you. Thank you. Women's Running Stories, where we explore the intersection between running and life. Because every woman who is committed to a running journey has a story to tell, and this is where you'll find those stories. I am host and producer Sheree Louise Turner. I'm a 53-year-old runner, and together with original music by musician and runner Cormac O'Regan, we bring these inspirational stories to life. Please join us to fuel your adventures. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters, it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Let's go.